what, which would be the best one? We have whether it's an organic dairy or a conventional dairy, non-GMO or everything in between, they have products that will help fit the bill. And again, when you look at forage quality, you think eliminating mycotoxins, the next gentleman you're going to hear talk a little bit is going to talk about animal health. But if we can... Can we back up to the other one, just for a moment? Yep. I figure nobody else is asking questions like that. You can ask, yep. So how do you pick? How, how do you know what to aim for? I mean, you can, you can spend a loon on money trying to preserve your crop. Yep. And everybody gives you the same pitch. Microtoxins. Yep. Whatever. Yeah. And of course, mycotoxins in the wet years, huge. Mm -hmm. um, not not so, always. Uh, apple toxin grows in a dry year. It's a drought year. Right? So, I, mean, I, I was at a seminar a month ago. They were saying the wet year is all the mycotoxins and fungus yeah. yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So, how do you get? I mean, I'm a small dairy farmer. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if I have good feed, I have my full feed, the grain comes up to do. Right, yep. So how do you know which is, where do you aim? The biggest thing, first of all, I, when you look at your forages, and I would say you want to you want to list your top five goals, right? If quality is the first thing you want to look at, you say list quality. And if you're, you probably work with an agronomist, I'm guessing, or maybe you work with Paris. Well, the first thing, whether you know, you think about soil fertility. What are you going to be planting? What what's going to be the seed and the hybrid you're going to plant? And all those things go into okay. Now you start with the soil fertility, the quality of the soil, and all that. Okay, then you've done that, right? Now it's growing. Now you're subject to whatever Mother Nature is providing. But now you think about okay, maturity. What's going to be the ideal maturity you want to cut that so you can maximize the quality? See, someone like me, I, I don't have a processor. So I have to cut mine a little bit greener. Okay. Otherwise, the corn is too hard. So I'm just pass the cap. Okay. So if I've got to cut mine, see most of mine is probably 30, 32 percent dry matter. Mm -hmm. So what kind of preserve am I looking for? Okay. As we go further, we'll, we'll I'll dig into that a little bit. But I, those are awesome questions. And those are great questions because as you're thinking about that in your situation, and I think you mentioned I heard you mentioned earlier you do VMR. Some VMR percentage of that and some conventional. And then you also do alfalfa? Low lignin alfalfa or conventional? We planted low lignin this year, but it's pretty much a crop of conventional. We have 50% of the cell. Okay. And then, okay. But those are great questions, so I'm glad you're asking. Um, so we think about that, and you know, you're going to take all kinds of notes from all the seminars you go to, but the biggest thing for us. And, and I'm glad you're asking the question because the only thing, the only question that's important is the one you have when you leave here. And hopefully we can give you some answers when you're evaluating things. Um, because you have to be all these things and every dairyman has to be. And that's why you are the best and the brightest and top half percent of the population. The other 99.5 couldn't do what you do. And that's a fact. That is a reality. And you have to do all these things. So when Jen shows up, I think they said earlier, as, as Tom said, IBA provides 5,000 products to Paris Farmers Union. I'm assuming they have another 5,000, right? Mm -hmm. So they got to really understand and try to understand how does one of those 10,000 products that they handle help on your dairy? That's why she comes once a month, or uh, Jen does, or JD does, and they say once a week. And they'll say, you know, these are some things that I think can help. Or they look at their... You're walking in your as an innocent bystander looking at things that may be able to simplify, work smarter, not harder, not those types of things. So that's why it's really beneficial when they show up because we know when you think about where the nutrients go, based on how you're going to make the forages, they're going to do one of two things. They're going to make all of one of these fine dairy products or they're going to make more common. Right? You guys have Burger Kings out here? In Maine. <laughs> have you seen, have you seen the advertisement for the Impossible Burger? Yeah, whatever. It's important that you know that. You see the Impossible Burger. I can honestly tell you I bought one and tried it. Right? And I know why they call it Impossible. Because it's Impossible to eat. <laughs> but you see they're getting sued now. There's a lawsuit now. They're suing Burger King's being sued by a bunch of vegans because they prepared the Impossible Burger on the same grill. 
which means there's some beef fat there, so they can't call it an Impossible Burger had some contamination, which is funny to me. The other thing that's comical is there's 21 ingredients. 11 of the ingredients in, that are in the Impossible Burger are common ingredients in dog food. So the next time you see somebody, next time you see somebody, you say, "Oh, that Impossible Burger! I eat that because I'm a vegan and I really want to eat good." Say, so why don't you just go to the grocery store and buy a can of Elf? It'll be just as good, right? You don't even have to fry it. So it's really, it's kind of interesting. So if you have somebody you don't like, buy them a gift certificate for an Impossible Burger. So you think about maturity, management, chopping moisture, chop length. These are all things, as you said, when you talk about, and you're talking with Jen, and you're saying, okay, I'm looking for an inoculant that's going to maximize my protection, fit my bill. These are my moistures. Here's my situation. That's why she's going to say, okay, of these 11 products, which ones would fit the best? They're in cover seal product selection. But ultimately... So what size do you think is the right size to cut? The what? What's the right size for cut? Right size for cut? Add them another page. You talk about the size of cut when you're, when you're harvesting the corn. On, on corn silage, are we talking yeah. about? Yeah, corn silage. Yeah, you want to be... Uh, if you could go a corn silage or theoretically like the cut about a half inch. You know the problem is is that the longer you can cut it, the better you're gonna be with the tougher it is to store. So that's what you run into. That's why you think about now people are going to shredlage like this. So does that shredlage really work? Because I know they yeah. push it out west. Does it seem to work, I should say? Yeah, it really does work, but with that factor in mind, the way you preserve that and store that is a bigger challenge. So yes, but it does work. It is good in cow diet. Guys are successful with it. I, you know, I can think of one gentleman that averages 100 pounds year-round, and he feeds snappage and shredlage. And you know, a lot of guys look at that diet and go, "Oh, boy, how do you get that kind of milk?" Out? But it's all the way to handle it. So again, the longer you can cut it, the better it's going to be for the cows. Tougher it is to store. Now on that shredlage, they have to make sure their knives are right all the time too, right? Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of expensive. They have to make sure that. That has the right cut and make sure that it packs good. Is it hard to pack? It is very hard to pack, yes. Yeah. Is it more buoyant or what? Yeah, it's just it's like it's, springs. Yeah, it's like trying to pack straw in comparison to a fine cut hay. It just gets a lot, a lot more air. And so you factor that in. I just wanted to show you this because of some of the, you mentioned you did raise some alfalfa. And you want to talk about making the feed store happy. If you cut alfalfa bud, you're going to have at least a ton of milk for every ton of forage you chop, if you get it bud. Yeah. If you let it get mature, and some people do, well, I want to gain a little bit of ground, I want to gain a little bit of volume, once alfalfa is 20 days old, you know the crown never changes. All that happens after the 20 days is you want, it's the stem that's growing, and you need the stem because that's going to slow the passage of the cow, so you're getting the fiber to slow it down. But if you think about letting it get grass and mature in volume, you get 657 pounds, of milk for every time you put up, which is only a third, okay? Well, the only person that's going to be happy when you're putting up this alfalfa grass at the tour is your feed guy, because you're still going to want to get this kind of milk out of it, but you're going to have to buy everything from the feed store. And ultimately, in a few months, you're going to find out, you know, I'm not making any money. So is that, that's based on protein? Yeah, that's based on protein, and then also the ADF and the It'd be energy too then, right? Yeah, yeah. And these are all put together, these are estimates, this is all put together by the University of Wisconsin at the research fund. So you think about that, and when you're looking at these products, there's more than 160 different companies out there. So if you have anybody call on you to sell you an oculus this year? Sure. More than one? Oh yeah. Well after we're done here today, Jen's going to distribute your name to all the other 159. <laughs> so just keep it busy. No, the fact is there's 160 companies and they're all really good, but they all don't fit every situation. And they're not all rep by good people. The benefit you have is you have Jen coming out and she puts your needs ahead of, ahead of hers. But that is not the case in all time, right? They, they start to focus on them all. Like, I always laugh, they say, why do you sell 11 products? Well, a lot of times, uh, company X, they sell one product, right? And it's funny, they know exactly what you need when they're pulling in your yard, they haven't even talked to you. They don't even know what you have for crops, but they know what you need. It's what I sell. It's the biggest margin. Yeah, right, right. 
So you're not going to run into that. So when you think about that, Jen's going to talk to you about product selection. It's going to be based on what are your realistic expectations. It's not management in a bag. So she's going to try to get you to cut your feed at the right time and then maximize. And you're going to tell her, well, I'm going to put it up. My dry matter is going to be 30, 32%. Well, you don't want clostridia. You don't want bacteric acid. So I'm going to have a product that's going to help you with that. And then I want to maintain and minimize whatever potential there is for mycotoxin growth, right? So you let her know what your outcomes are, what's worked well in the past, and what hasn't. And that's important. Just it's, not, it's just a tool. And you're going to let her know what your goals are, your desired outcomes. You want the highest quality feed, lowest in mycotoxin and mold, and the best possible product for feed for your cows to for maximize. The cheapest price. <laughs> Biggest return for the money you invest. That's right. right? That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. You know the number one question I frame all 48 states, the number one question I give when somebody says, well, you sell inoculant, how much does it cost per ton, right? I always tell them that's the dumbest question I've ever heard. <laughs> and you know why? Because, because most of these companies, they sell one formula. Yeah. I, I had four different people came, they all, they all had one formula. And that was what they told, was that one formula. And they try to give you a price, and whoever can get the cheapest is the best, right? Yeah. But the problem with that is you want to buy the products that's going to maximize your return on the money you spend. So if you spend 50 cents or a dollar or a dollar fifty, the idea is to maximize the money you're going to get back for what you spend. I'll give you an example. I had a guy in Texas last year said, I'm going to tweak 25,000 ton of corn silage, and I can buy something from company X that's going to charge me 30 cents a treated ton. Can you do better than that? And I said, yes, I can. I can sell you something for 25 cents a treating time. And he says, really, 25 cents? I said, absolutely. He said, is it going to work? I said, no. <laughs> You're going to be wasting your money. But if your goal is to spend as little money as possible, I can do that. But the fact is that stuff you're spending 30 cents on is not going to meet your objectives either. So what you want to do is understand what are you trying to accomplish and what product is going to best do that and then find out how much will that cost me, or what's the investment going to be. And it's more of an investment, not a cost, and it's going to give you a return. Everything that Tom's going to sell you at Paris Farmers Union is going to be based on science. You, you've always heard the anecdotal things. Oh, yeah, I used this once. A guy said it was really good. I remember about 35 years ago, there was a company in the Midwest that was, it was called Duncan Feeds. They're out of business now, so I'm not saying anything's going to hurt anybody's feelings. But I used to chuckle because they said, well, you feed our product, feed four pounds per cow per day, and it'll fix everything that's going on in your herd. But they didn't know what was going on in your herd. And if that four pounds don't work, just double it. I'm just trying to find one product in my line where I can say that. If it doesn't work at the recommended, just double it up and you'll be good. And we're not going to gamble with your money. You guys get up every day and that's enough of a gamble just walking from your house to your barn. You have all kinds of things going on. When Jen sells you something, she is not going to gamble with your money. You want to go do that? Go to you guys have any casinos in Maine? Yeah. Well, you can do that on your own, right? The chances are they build those for winners, by the way, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Well, and we know that. So we're not going to gamble with your money. You guys every day have enough of a gamble. And we know from 1980 until now, it was 11% of the people who use products. Today, in 2017, it's 83% of people are using inoculants. Why is that important? Because by 1980 to 2017, I remember in 1980 when I first started selling product or talking about forage consulting, everybody thought it was snake oil, right? If you go back in time, and you know what, in 20, 1980, even though there was only 11% of it, a lot of it was snake oil, right? Basically minerals. Well, it was just, yeah, it was, it, was, it was just, today, the research and all the things behind it, most of them are, are really a lot better. You know, what type of applicator you can do. The only thing I can tell you is, a, as a cow whisperer, if I were to come out and talk to your cows, the one thing they're going to tell me is I want IBA treated for it. Okay? They want to taste sweet. <laughs> so, with that being said, we got, I got some brochures you can take or you don't want to take, but when you're looking at evaluating products, I'm going to tell you something, the, the quickest way to do it, you can look at your products, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you which ones to buy. Uh, Jen's going to do that next week when she stops off. But 
you're going to find with our products, we add three grams of active ingredient. That's the first thing you look at when you're looking at somebody says, well, you, I think you should buy my inoculum because it's better than theirs. Say, well, how many, how many grams of active ingredient are they putting on? That's the first thing you want to see. Then, is it the right type of bacteria? Is it the right amount of bacteria? Is it the right amount of bacteria at the right time? Are they adding enzymes for digestibility? You look at BMR corn, the critical thing is improving the digestibility, and we had enzymes for that. Does it have stimulants that are going to also really speed up the bacteria and the activation? In all of our lines, so if you look at everything here, and we have uh, seven of them on the front page here, you're going to find the base for them is all the same. Okay? They all have little twists on the bottom, like this is good, better, best and the enzymes change a little bit, and they'll add, like they all start with a base of three bacteria, okay? And that's important, and of those three, there are 150,000 colony forming units. And if you look at any university data, talk to Cornell, any of the universities, they're going to tell you, you have to be at a minimum 100,000 CFUs. All of the IV lines are going to have, have a minimum 150,000 CFU. 